It doesn't happen often that when you pull up to a distillery, you see a combine. Have you ever wondered how much land it takes to produce a bottle of whiskey? We're at Frey Ranch, and everything that it takes to produce a bottle of whiskey happens right here. So if you want to find out, stick around. So here we are, we're at Frey Ranch in Nevada, and I'm here with Colby. Thank hey. you for coming on. Yeah, cheers. Cheers. So I wanted to figure out how much land does it take to produce a bottle of whiskey? And I found out that your distillery does pretty much everything on site. And now I've been here and I've toured around, my mind is blown at the lengths that you've gone to to figure out how to do everything absolutely here. So tell the people who you are and what it is that you do here. Yeah, so I'm Colby Frey. I'm the founder and what I call whiskey farmer at the Frey Ranch. Um, we grow 100% of the grains that go into all of our whiskeys. So the wheat, rye, barley, and corn that's in every one of our bourbons and rye whiskeys um, is grown right here on the farm. And, and it really means a lot to us because we're not only distillers, but we're also farmers and they're both equally important. How long have you been farming in the state of Nevada, your family. So my family's been here since 1854. Nevada didn't even become a state until 1864, 10 years later. We had the first deeded property in the state of Nevada um, was to my great, great grandfather. I'm a fifth generation, which seems like we could have a lot more, but it seems like my family has kids late in life. <laughs> okay. But uh, I'm a fifth generation Nevada farmer. And so the importance of that is is the knowledge of what to do and a lot of times even more importantly what not to do mm -hmm. is passed on um, from generation to generation so there's been a lot of trial and error and, and we know how to grow grains in our specific soil and our climate with our you know our irrigation techniques everything and so that that knowledge from generation to generation is really important I, there was at one point that there was somebody that was living in like a yeah. A mud hut almost. Yeah. That was my, my grandfather lived in literally a dirt dugout. It was in the 1930s and it had a tin roof with dirt on top of it, a dirt floor. And he lived in it for three years to save up enough money to buy, put a down payment on this place. And how did he save that money? Like Just, how do you make money to save? So, and so he pulled a bunch of trees that were all dead and he made this unfarmable farm ground farmable and farmed it for a couple years, pulled out thousands of trees. I mean, it was backbreaking work made it farmable, made a little bit of money off of it. It was actually given to him because another farmer couldn't pay him um, from, for some work that he did. And then um, he got a little bit for down payment on this place and, and bought this place for $60,000, which was considered like, he's gonna go broke, everybody said. Yeah, I mean, that, that like back then it was yeah. like a, uh, paying $100 million for something, yeah, I right? Mean, it's like crazy. Today you can barely buy a pickup truck. You right, know? Yeah. <laughs> that's nuts. So your situation here is a little bit unique because most of the time distillers are buying grain from other, you know, people who grow it. That's not the important part of what it is that they end up producing. And it's actually kind of a interesting topic. I mean, if you go online and you look on YouTube, people are curious about like, you know, how much grain does it take to produce a bottle of whiskey, right? But we can go one step further here, which is one of the only places in the world that we could, to ask the question of how much land mass does it take to produce a bottle of whiskey? And so let's talk about your whiskey production process because it's not normal for somebody to do everything from start to finish on site. Mm -hmm. What makes you guys different? Yeah, so it all starts in the field for us. So we're farmers and distillers. They're both equally important. And so um, we start off in the field with the different grain varieties. There's hundreds of different grain varieties that we can plant. They all maybe have a little bit different flavors. They might mill a little bit different. They might ferment a little bit different. So we, we, we experimented with a ton of varieties of grain in the, in the first place. Then there's different irrigation techniques, like things like, like drought, you know, stressing the grains might make it different than giving it all the water it needs. Um, you know, there's so many things. Then um, on top of that, fertilizer management. Like for example, the more nitrogen fertilizer you put in the crop, traditionally the more yield you get. Mm -hmm. So a normal farmer, more yield means more money. You sell it by the ton or by the bushel or whatever. And so that's better, right? But for us, that's not always good because when you bump up your nitrogen, 
you actually increase your proteins in the grain. And proteins are inverse to nitrogen. So when proteins go up, nitrogen, uh, when proteins are inverse to starch, sorry. Mm, yeah. And when star proteins go up, starch goes down. Well, starch is what we're looking for in the distillery. Mm -hmm. where that starch is actually what ends up being the alcohol in the right. end. And so by, by growing our own grain, sacrificing quantity for quality, we can end up with a better quality, you know, output at the end. And so um, that's where it all starts for us. You know, then we go into our distilling process. We actually have a continuous and a pot still. Um, we feel like continuous stills you can get better more quantity out of but you can really fine tune a pot still with your heads and your tails and you know what what you're getting out of it you can really tailor that with a pot still so we really feel like having both you get quantity and quality every time i see somebody doing it this way it just it's a sign of respect no oh, thank you yeah. no and, and that's what I, I tell everybody you can get quantity off of a, a continuous still but you get better quality off of a pot still for those those cuts and everything else but for us, by stripping it down in the continuous still and then redistilling it in the pot still, we kind of get both because instead of putting 8% mash in the pot still, you know, the, the reason why it's so inefficient is, is because you have to wait for it to heat up. You have to collect the heads, the middle run, the tails. You have to wait for it to cool down. You have to empty it. So it's really inefficient and kind of slow. So instead of putting 8% mash in the pot still, we put 40% stripped alcohol, low wines from the, the continuous still into the pot still and that way we're getting five times more per batch so we're getting more quantity and quality right but what's more interesting to me than that is the fact that you guys are actually malting your own barley so i don't think that any major kentucky distillery malts their own barley and there's not a lot of malting houses in the United States and the ones that are here usually focus on beer. Mm -hmm. And virtually everybody in the United States is hiring somebody else to malt their barley for them. Our trademark, what we call it is ground to glass. We have ground to glass. from the ground to the glass. And this guy right here that you're looking at, he went out to look to see what products he could buy that would allow him to to equipment, malt his own barley yeah. his his equipment and he ended up building his own and i've seen it and it's amazing yeah we're really lucky there's a, a guy here in town that helped uh, helped us you know kind of get it all set up and, and welded it all for us and everything but it's all made and designed right here in fallon nevada the guy actually has his own malt company now it's called 40 mile malt <laughs> and he created his own and it's he's he's a really a genius and that kind of stuff but uh that's the, the thing is as a farmer you really have to go out and figure out how you're going to get a lot of stuff done because you can't always hire somebody to come in and fix your broken pipes or your your electrical problems or whatever and so if you did we'd go broke the margins are so thin that that we just can't afford it and so a lot of the stuff here in the distillery we do all of ourselves. we do all of our own electrical all of our own plumbing gas lines steam lines um you know everything we try to do on our own which is great because then we really know how to fix things we can keep it operating we know how to get the most out of our products too because we really understand how things work and, and what it takes to get them the way that we want it hey Wes hey man I'm here what are you doing I'm here for the bottle sure oh uh wow well, so you just carried all this well I put them in my seat and I uh, kind of put the seat belt over them and things just to keep them from but this one did fall on the ground I hope it's okay yeah 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 sometimes I'm you good you know I just couldn't just I can't decide really what I wanted to bring so. well I, I recommend that you get one of these oh a Mary Poppins bag yes it's very similar to what Mary Poppins would carry except for it holds whiskey Ooh. Okay, tell me more. All right, so Bourbon Real Talk has had this custom design for whiskey lovers. Nothing like this has ever existed before. Ever. It's been designed to hold nice. all bottles, okay? Every, so like size, even a huh? wide bottle like this one, look at it, it fits right in there. Ooh. Super tall bottles like E.H. Taylor, no problem. What about the Fits right fork? in there. Right Leaper's in there. fork. Oh, Look at this. Know. Even the weird shaped like scotch like bottles. Hey, like this is a weird, I bet this one doesn't fit. Nope, that one's gonna fit just fine, I promise. Oh wow, okay. And then we've got so how many can you fit in here? I mean You yeah. can fit six in here. Ooh. If this is something that you need because you carry bottles places. Head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com and pick one of these bad boys yeah. up. If you want to look really cool at your next tasting that you show up to a bottle share, walk in with one of these Mary Poppins bourbon bags <laughs> and just keep the bottles coming out of them. Keep just, them coming. 
And, and truth uh, be told, I've carried up to 10 bottles in this bag. Mm. All right. Because there's separation in between the padding, so you can fit two in the center, two on the sides, boom, yeah. 10 bottles. Boom. That's everything you need. Okay? Everything you need. That's what we're here for, to keep you hooked up with all the cool bourbon lover tchotchkes. Tchotchkes. And also, check out the other great things that are on bourbonrealtalk.com. Yeah, do it. I'll see y'all later. So let's talk yields. Uh, to go back to the original question, how much land does it take to produce a bottle of bourbon? So I am going to give you permission to use notes because this is as a matter of fact technical, I, detailed information. There's a lot of math involved in this. So these let's numbers. do the math. So, let's okay. go through it. All right, the math. So each batch is about eight thousand five hundred fifty-five pounds of grain, right? Okay. That makes about twenty-eight hundred thirty-five bottles of whiskey. Okay. Um, now. It, it's different because corn, wheat, rye, and barley all yield different per acre, right? All right. So if we're talking about a per acre, um, we want to uh, like calculate out the bourbon. So it's wheat, rye, barley, and corn. So if we calculate how much our yields are, everything else, it actually takes about 15.35 square feet of the farm to grow one bottle of whiskey. So essentially, when you buy a bottle of whiskey, you've basically rented about 15 square feet of the farm for a year, you know, cause that's what it took to create that bottle of whiskey. Fifth, you rented 15 square feet of land that was producing and somebody was working and the labor that it took to make that happen and the grain and all the inputs and the, and, and preparing the land and the, and the fertilizer and, that's that's phenomenal. Yeah. So fifteen in that, square feet. In that fifteen square feet, we get about three point zero two pounds of grain, and that's what it takes to make a bottle of whiskey too. And so, and your products are four grain. Our products are four grain. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. So each each grain yields a little bit different. I mean, if we're talking just corn, that's the biggest yielder. We get quite a bit more than the other grains, you know. And so, as like our like our rye whiskey, for example, our rye whiskey, we only get about a thousand bottles per acre. Whereas if you're just talking about corn by itself, we'd get 3,300 bottles per acre. So, I mean, rye is like such a low yielder. That's why a lot of times you see rye more expensive in the store and it's just not quite, quite as big of a yielder. Hmm. Well, I would like to say to everybody out there watching at home that we have had the opportunity to try some of your experimental things that you're doing, some of the single barrels that you're doing, the rye whiskey and I am impressed. So I, I tell everybody that if you're gonna make a single malt and you wanna use a pot still and do it, you know, double distilled, that's great. But if you're making like a mashable whiskey, like a bourbon or a rye, um, I guess single malt's technically a mashable whiskey in the United States, but I mean like bourbon, rye, you know, traditional, you know, mash bill that would be made into an American style whiskey, if you're doing double distillation of pot still, it can be a little bit oily. Some people do it better than others, but when you're trying to manage for yield, sometimes it produces a result that people don't like and it turns people off. You have found a way to make something that's significantly better without compromising quality. And for any of you viewers out there, if you want to see what kind of whiskey that's being produced here, I'd love for you to try to find a way to pick up a bottle. Where all are you distributed at? Well, right now, we're only in Nevada and California. We want to do a really good job at where we're at. And so we just don't have the quantity to go outside of those states today. Mm -hmm. um, every year we've increased our production, but we're limited to sell this year what we made five years ago. And that just wasn't quite as much to as much as we needed to make to be outside of Nevada and California. But you can buy it on our website, freyranch.com. And we do have special stuff come out occasionally, and we always release that to our mailing list first, mm -hmm. which is also available. You can join the mailing list on uh, freyranch.com. We try not to spam everybody too much. I know that's always annoying. So, um, but anyways, that's where we get all of our special releases, you know, announced first. Yeah, and I've I've tried some of the barrels that are going to be coming out in special releases, and so has Wes, who is currently behind two cameras. And um, I will tell you that Wes uh, made the declaration that one of the whiskeys he tried was uh, his one of one. His favorite whiskey he's ever Ever? Tried. Ever. Whoa. Uh, Colby didn't know that. Yeah. So, that's amazing. Um, Wes has really good taste, though. So <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but if this is your first time to join in on the podcast, I'd love to welcome you and say thank you. And uh, Colby, I have to apologize because you didn't know this part was coming. Uh, but the, the, the purpose of this podcast is to bring people together around bourbon. And I found that bourbon has an amazing ability to connect people. And that's something that's super important to me because in, in 2014, uh, my brother committed suicide. And he, he, was, uh, he, he had been discharged from the army. Um, he, he was discharged honorably, but when he got out, he was badly addicted to painkillers, which is not an uncommon thing. And he felt alone and he did not feel connected. And in the aftermath of that, I was looking for a way to kind of, you know, draw people together and help people to understand that there were individuals that cared about them, that, you know, that they had a place in this world. And at the same time, my interest in the, ho in the hobby of collecting whiskey was growing. And I started to notice that whiskey would bring people together of different ideological views, like people that would disagree politically or disagree over whatever. And I thought maybe there's a way to use this to help connect people. And that's what kind of drew me into it. And eventually it developed into this podcast. But <clears throat> during that process, I started to see kind of the underbelly of social media. And there is a thing out there that we at Bourbon Real Talk like to call whiskey trolls. Mm -hmm. And those are individuals that they're not there for the camaraderie. They're not there for the community. And I thought to myself, if they can be hateful to a stranger, even though they don't know them, doesn't that also mean that I can love a stranger even though I don't know them? And that's why I end every podcast the same way, and that's this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time. I'm Barbara and Real Talk. No, oh, that's great. Cheers. <laughs>